Hey guys, welcome back. I'm Emma, and we are playing Dragon Age Inquisition. Oh, my favorite game in the series. Alright, so we just got to Haven, we woke up, had our sweet elven friend. I don't want to call her a servant girl, because that makes me sad. Came in, woke us up, so we're looking around. We just got in here. Now we definitely overheard Cassandra and Chancellor Roderick talking, but I wanted to have a look around first. Just totally booped that. <laughs> oh. Everyone's favorite part. Oh my goodness, this is so long. Please feel free to skip over this if you want. God, even scrolling is forever. Okay. Chantry hierarchy. Divine is the titular head of the Chantry. Although since the schism split the Imperial Chantry into its own faction, there are now in fact two divines at any one time. One divine, informally called the White Divine, is a woman housed in the Grand Cathedral in Valbrio. The other, known as the Black Divine, is a man housed in the Argent Spire in Minrathus, which is in Tevinter. Neither divine recognizes the existence of the other, of course, and the informal names are considered sacrilegious. No matter the gender, divine is addressed as most holy or your perfection. Beneath the rank of divine is the grand cleric. Each grand cleric presides over an Oh, I didn't realize Elthina was such a big deal. Each grand cleric presides over numerous chantries and represents the highest religious authority for their region. They travel to Valbrio when the College of Clerics convenes, but otherwise remain where they are assigned. All Grand Clerics are addressed as Your Grace. Beneath the Grand Cleric is the Mother, or the Imperial Chantry, the Father. If a Mother is in charge of a particular Chantry, revered is appended to her title. These are the priests responsible for administering to the spiritual well-being of their flock. A Mother or Revered Mother is addressed as Your Reverence. Brothers and sisters, oh, okay, I don't know if when they're talking about brothers, they're talking about, like, the black divine in Tevinter, because the debate's still kind of open as to whether or not men can serve in a religious, like, administrative capacity, like, administers of the faith, not like an administer pushing papers, in Southern Thetis. Okay, brothers and sisters form the rank and file of the Chantry and consist of three main groups, affirmed, initiates, and clerics. Affirmed are the lay brethren of the Chantry, who's those regular folk who have turned to the Chantry for succor. Often, they are people who have led a difficult or irreligious life and have chosen to go into seclusion, or even orphans and similar unfortunates who were raised into Chantry life. The affirmed take care of the Chantry and are in turn afforded a life of quiet contemplation, no questions asked. Only those folk who take vows become initiates. These are men and women in training whether in academic knowledge or the martial skills of a warrior. All initiates receive an academic education, although only those who seek to become Templars learn how to fight in addition. Clerics are the true academics of the Chantry, those men and women who have dedicated themselves to the pursuit of knowledge. They are often found in Chantry archives, sages presiding over libraries of books and arcane knowledge. The most senior of those clerics, placed in charge of such archives, are given the title Elder, although such a rank is still beneath that of mother. All other brothers and sisters are addressed simply by noting their title before their name, such as Brother, <gasps> Brother Genetivi from a guide for ambassadors from a vein. Okay, so that's going to kind of lead me to believe that they can indeed. Oh, there's two books. I'm going to spare you guys that for the moment because I feel bad. Mm, best part about being a rogue. Like, playing through this and in Origins, where I also played a rogue, I didn't realize... Oh my god, there's all books down here, guys. I'm sorry. I didn't realize that you couldn't, like, pick locks and stuff. Like, I just thought that was part of the game. I would choose to go down here first. I'm sorry. I feel really bad. Oh my god. So this whole episode is going to be codex entries? Is, is that the gist of this? The Disciples of Andraste. The Disciples of Andraste are unique in all of history. The cult preceded the Chantry and kept itself so hidden and isolated that it actually survived to modern day. 
the disciples made their home a high in the Frostback Mountains, in a village called Haven, which is now a sanctuary for pilgrims of the Chantry. It is understood that the disciples were descendants of the first followers of Andraste, who brought her ashes to Ferelden and built the temple to house it. Because they had pledged themselves to the keeping of the Temple of Sacred Ashes, the disciples of Andraste never left the Frostbacks. For 900 years, they kept strangers away, killing all who came close, and were completely oblivious to the world that advanced beyond the boundaries of their home. Having developed separately from the traditions of the Andraste Enchantry, the disciples were led by revered fathers. However, little else is known about the original beliefs of the disciples, for they had turned from their noble heritage by the time they were discovered. Almost all scholars believe that the centuries-long isolation imposed upon the village led to the necessity for inbreeding. This practice unlikely led, likely led to a greater incidence of madness, which may explain why the cult was at the time of its discovery in 930, worshipping a high dragon. So there was a good snippet from last episode um, of my playthrough of Origins when we go into that village and kind of experience a little bit of that madness, a little bit of that inbreeding that little creepy boy running around with a, a finger bone that he discovered and <laughs> that was apparently um, smooth from constant handling. According to writings discovered in Haven, the disciples of Andraste showed reverence to the dragon, believing it to be the prophet reborn. The egg clutches and dragonlings of the dragon were afforded great honor for being Andraste's offspring and were cared for by the cult. The dragon never attacked the cult, being cunning enough to recognize how this arrangement benefited it. In keeping with, with dragons, in 930 Dragon, the disciples were wiped out by the hero of Ferelden, who was on a quest to retrieve the sacred ashes of Andraste. Yikes. From before Andrastianism, the Forgotten Faiths, by Sister Rondwin of Tantervale. Oh my god. I feel... I'm gonna come back for these. I feel bad reading them all at once because in this entire episode is just going to be me reading. Oh. Oh. All right. I definitely was trying to light that torch, but that is not what happened. That was a sweet sliding move. Also, who would leave these little packages around down here? Okay, more codex entries. I feel like the beginning of the game is gonna have a lot more than the rest because we're just discovering so many new things. I'm glad that there's no bones down here. That's somewhat of a relief. Okay, I'm sorry for exploring this first. <laughs> I feel bad now. We could have just gone into the, like, into the main room with Cassandra and Roderick. But, oh my god. Okay, this one's not that long, I'm sorry. Misplaced notes. Notes written by one of the scholars responsible for restoring Haven. The notes have obviously come loose from a ledger of some sort. It took weeks scrubbing bloodstains from the stone. One of two things is true. Either stone is more porous than I thought, or maker's beard. There must have been a lot of blood. I didn't know the maker had a beard. How many people died? I'm so relieved I didn't have to deal with the altars of sacrifice the first arrivals found. Ooh, yikes. Those were tossed off a cliff think. So now we just have to deal with the stains on the walls and the floors. If this doesn't clean up in a day or two, I'm asking for some fresh plaster. Maybe we can cover them up. Still, it's not all bad. Haven is a beautiful place, and while working in the dungeons, we found scraps of paper with writing that looked like Brother Ferdinand Genetivis. He was held here for weeks before the hero of Ferdinand found him. <laughs> so this is even adding more lore to our journey in Origins. I really like that. Also, the way we like slippy slide right in front of our locks. I like how they're like, oh, hey, we, we took this lady in and now she's like sifting through the dungeons. Sorry, guys. Okay, so we have several things left to read. I'll probably just revisit them at the end of the episode, maybe. Or maybe we'll do them next time. So we just kind of have less on our plate. Because we have three more things to read down here, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, did I lose my way? There we go. Oh. <sighs> The lighting is so nice. Everything looks so good. Okay. Now that we've had our, our mini bout of exploration, 
We've got so many other things to look at, but I'm afraid all of it's reading oriented, so let's get some action in first. Chain her! I want her prepared for travel to the capital for trial. Disregard that and leave us. You walk a dangerous line, Seeker. The breach is stable, but it is still a threat. I will not ignore it. Hmm. I did everything I could to close the breach. It almost killed me. Yet you live. A convenient result in so far as you're concerned. Have a care, Chancellor. The breach is not the only threat we face. Someone was behind the explosion at the Conclave. Someone Most Holy did not expect. Perhaps they died with the others, or have allies who yet live. I am a suspect? You, and many others. But not the prisoner. I heard the voices in the temple. The Divine called to her for help. So her survival, that thing on her hand, all a coincidence. Providence. The Maker sent her to us in our darkest hour. Oh my goodness. So many options. I feel like she would not be under the compulsion that she's... a sort of chosen one. You realize I'm an elf. A Dalish elf. I have not forgotten. No matter what you are or what you believe, you are exactly what we needed when we needed it. The breach remains, and your mark is still our only hope of closing it. This is not for you to decide. You know what this is, Chancellor. A writ from the Divine, granting us the authority to act. As of this moment, I declare the Inquisition reborn. We will close the breach, we will find those responsible, and we will restore order, with or without your approval. This is the Divine's directive. Rebuild the Inquisition of old. Find those who will stand against the chaos. We aren't ready. We have no leader, no numbers. And now, no Chantry support. But we have no choice. We must act now, with you at our side. Oh, this is so nostalgic and beautiful. What is the Inquisition of old, exactly? It preceded the Chantry. People who banded together to restore order in a world gone mad. After, they laid down their banner and formed the Templar Order, but the Templars have lost their way. We need those who can do what must be done united under a single banner once more. Ooh, I didn't, I didn't remember that. But aren't you still part of the Chantry? <laughs> Is that what you see? The Chantry will take time to find a new divine. And then it will wait for her direction. But we cannot wait. So many grand clerics died at the Conclave. No, we are on our own. Perhaps forever. I'm kind of glad that we read through those coded entries now, because now I understand the significance of a grand cleric, right? I don't really like either of those. You're trying to start a holy war. We are already at war. You are already involved. Its mark is upon you. As to whether the war is holy, that depends on what we discover. I'm just doing all these so you get the, the max amount of dialogue. What if I refuse? You can go if you wish. You should know that while some believe you chosen, many still think you guilty. The Inquisition can only protect you if you are with us. We can also help you. It will not be easy if you stay. But you cannot pretend this has not changed you. Hmm. Trying to think about this from her perspective. As we discussed, um, she, she is a daily self. She kind of grew up hearing Miris talk about 
the stories of her experiences with the entities in Valrio, with Falassan, with Briala, with Celine and Michelle. I feel like she's a little less perhaps elitist or bigoted because there is some bigotry in the elves and the humans. Elves don't like humans, humans don't like elves. I feel like she might view this as her her story and would want to help. If you're truly trying to restore order, that is the plan. Help us fix this before it's too late. I love Cassandra. The character writing is just so good. It, it, it is in Dragon Age as a whole, but I have a particular soft spot for Inquisition. Like, everyone's just like, oh, like, DA2 is not as great and stuff, but I don't know, like, DA2 had some of the best characters. and the mages. Inquisition has such a level of grandeur that the other two don't. Just saying. The cinematography here is just... It's just so good. Alright. Now we are actually free to run around. I love the cutscenes and stuff. Oh, we're in our actual armor now? So we had that... Um, starting mod armor? I must have triggered a cutscene, I think. So we have that starting mod armor, so we look like a Dalish person instead of... I actually don't remember what the normal starting attire is, but clearly that was superior. I love that set of armor. Kind of like Meryl's from DA2. Does it trouble you? Hmm. I feel like she's kind of plucky. It stopped spreading, and it doesn't hurt. We take our victories where we can. What's important is that your mark is now stable, as is the breach. You've given us time. And Solas believes a second attempt might succeed, provided the Mark has more power. The same level of power used to open the breach in the first place. That is not easy to come by. Hmm. Clearly you have something in mind. We do.
You've met Commander Cullen, leader of the Inquisition's forces. It was only for a moment on the field. I'm pleased you survived. This is Lady Josephine Montelier, our ambassador and chief diplomat. Anderan Atishan. You speak Elven? You've just heard the entirety of it, I'm afraid. And of course, you know Sister Liliana. My position here involves a degree of... She is our spymaster. <laughs> yes. Tactfully put, Cassandra. <laughs> I love Cassandra so much. Also, her hair reminds me of vignettes in Carnival Row. Or I, I should say, when I watched Carnival Row, I was like, oh, Cassandra's hair. Pleased to meet you all. I mentioned that your mark needs more power to close the breach for good. Which means we must approach the rebel mages for help. Yes. And I still disagree. The Templars could serve just as well. No. We need power, <laughs> Commander. Enough magic poured into that mark. Might destroy us all. Templars could suppress the breach, weaken it, so... Pure speculation. I was a Templar. I know what they're capable of. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, neither group will even speak to us yet. The Chantry has denounced the Inquisition, and you specifically. <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> hmm. I don't know if it's that they think she did it. I think it's that this is a a different authority figure that they have to compete with, and so they want to run a smear campaign. That didn't take long. Shouldn't they be busy arguing over who's going to become divine? Some are calling you, a Dalish elf, the Herald of Andraste. That frightens the Chantry. The remaining clerics have declared it blasphemy. And we, heretics, for harboring you. Chancellor Roderick's doing, no doubt. It limits our options. Approaching the mages or Templars for help is currently out of the question. Just how am I the Herald of Andraste? People saw what you did at the temple, how you stopped the breach from growing. They have also heard about the woman seen in the rift when we first found you. They believe that was Andraste. Even if we tried to stop that view from spreading. Which we have not. The point is, everyone is talking about you. It's quite the title, isn't it? How do you feel about that? I feel like I want to... The first time I played this, I didn't know anything about the Dalish Elves. This the first time I touched Dragon Age. And so, like, I just didn't understand that there were different religions in play. Uh, but here, I feel like she's deeply Dalish. And so, uh, would not be comfortable. I'm no herald of anything. Particularly not on Draste. I'm sure the Chantry would agree. People are desperate for a sign of hope. For some, you're that sign. And to others, a symbol of everything that's gone wrong. They aren't more concerned about the breach, the real threat. They do know it's a threat. They just don't think we can stop it. The Chantry is telling everyone you'll make it worse. There is something you can do. A Chantry cleric by the name of Mother Giselle has asked to speak to you. She is not far, and knows those involved far better than I. Her assistance could be invaluable. I'll see what she has to say. You will find Mother Giselle tending to the wounded in the hinterlands near Redcliffe. Look for other opportunities to expand the Inquisition's influence while you're there. We need agents to extend our reach beyond this valley, and you're better suited than anyone to recruit them. In the meantime, let's think of other options. I won't leave this all to the Herald. Don't call me that. Come on, she just said she wasn't chill. All right. So is there anything we need to do at the moment? There's nothing Scott. to do with fairness. We simply can't accommodate them if they bring that many servants. I will speak to the Duchess. She can be reasoned with, after a fashion. I love like playing this on PC because I can tell where they're standing around the table by where I'm hearing it in my headphones. That's pretty cool. Okay. 
So, Scout the Hinterlands. Mother Giselle was last seen in the Hinterlands outside Red Cliff, tending refugees who fled the fighting between renegade Templars and apostate mages. The last report suggests that the vicious struggle between the two groups has spread to the Hinterlands, catching the refugees and Mother Giselle in the middle. It is vital to protect her and, if possible, restore order to the area. So, it looks like we only get to use Liliana. If Giselle dies, any host of Chantry support dies with her. My scouts will slip past the fighting, find her, and protect her. I usually am a diplomacy girl. I don't like to use force, really. But we only have one choice here. Oh, parting! All right, Scant the Hitterlands, we avoided the fighting as best we could. It's every bit as bad as we'd feared. The apostates are mad, attacking anything that moves, and it appears that the Templars here aren't following anyone's orders any longer. We located Mother Giselle and are trying to protect her, but she refuses to leave the refugees until you've ensured their safety, which is kind. That will be hard to do without troops to push the apostates and the Templars out of the area. Commander Cullen asked me to make inquiries of Master Dennett, a retired horse master of Redcliffe, who lives in the area. We tried to contact him about obtaining better horses for the Inquisition, but we've been unable to get through the fighting. Thank you. Not now. So let's explore a little bit more. I'm not necessarily worried about missions right now. Um, do you guys even want to watch me do missions? Or do you want me to handle that on my own time? I think it's kind of important to watch them because aspects of the game are affected by it and I feel like there might be parts that pull in lore from two origins or asunder mass empire um, so perhaps I'll just answer my own question and say I will go ahead and do that we'll try to either do that at the beginning or the end of episodes so that people aren't forced to sit there and watch it if they don't want to does that sound reasonable Whew, so many codexes. Oh my goodness. Okay, thank you for that. Oh my god, there's so many. I feel like I just have to make an episode for codex entries. Let's at least go finish the ones in the dungeon so I don't forget about them. Because if I forget about them, I'll be sad. There's only three and hopefully they aren't that long. And I mean, they were really useful. I'm gonna hit that every time I come in here. Okay, let's just street it. Founding of the Chantry. Cordelis Dracon. Okay, good, I was like, no, not more. <laughs> King of the city state of Orlais, was a man of uncommon ambition. In the year negative 15 ancient, the young king became construction over a great temple dedicated to the maker and declared that by its completion, he would only have united the warring city states of the south he would have brought Andrasian belief to the world. In negative three ancient, the temple was completed. There in its heart, Dracon knelt before the eternal flame of Andraste and was crowned ruler of the Empire of Orlais. His first act as emperor to declare the Chantry as the established Andrasian religion of the Empire. It took three years and several hundred votes before Alessa of Mont Samad was elected to lead the new Chantry. Upon her coronation as divine, she took the name Justinia, in honor of the disciple who recorded Andraste's songs. In that moment, the ancient era ended, and the divine age began. From Ferelden, Folklore and History, by S Sister Patrine, Chantry Scholar. I was like, Patrice? No! But it's Patrine. Oh, did we not go in here? Or maybe we did. Andraste, Bride of the Maker. It looks like we're getting our religion lessons today. There was once a tiny fishing village on the Waking Sea that was set upon by the Tevinter Imperium, which enslaved the villagers to be sold in the markets of Inrathis, leaving behind only the old and the infirm. One of the captives was the child Andraste. She was raised in slavery in a foreign land. She escaped, 
then made the long and treacherous journey back to her homeland alone. She rose from nothing to be the wife of an Alamari warlord. Isn't that like the barbarian people? Each day she sang to the gods, asking them to help her people who remained slaves in Tevinter. The false gods of the mountains and the winds did not answer her, but the true god did. The maker spoke. He showed her all the works of his hands, the fade, the world, and all the creatures therein. He showed her how men had forgotten him, lavishing devotion upon mute idols and demons, and how he had left them to their fate. But her voice had reached him, and so captivated him that he offered her a place at his side, that she might rule all of creation. But Andraste would not forsake her people. She begged the Maker to return, to save his children from the cruelty of the Imperium. Reluctantly, the Maker agreed to give man another chance. Andraste went back to her husband, Mafarath, and told him all the Maker had revealed to her. Together, they rallied the Alamari and marched forth against the mage lords of the Imperium, and the Maker was with them. The Maker's sword was creation itself, fire and flood, famine and earthquake. Everywhere they went, Andraste sang to the people of the Maker, and they heard her. The rank of Andraste's followers grew until they were a vast tide washing over the Imperium. And when Mafra saw that the people love Andraste and not him, a worm grew within his heart, gnawing upon it. At last, the armies of Andraste and Mafra stood before the very gates of Enrathis, but Andraste was not with them, for Mafarath had schemed in secret to hand Andraste over to the Tevinter. For this, the Archon would give Mafarath all the lands to the south of the Waking Sea. And so, before all the armies of the Almarian of Tevinter, Andraste was tied to a stake and burned while her earthly husband turned his armies aside and did nothing, for his heart had been devoured. But as he watched the pyre, the Archon softened. He took pity on Andraste and drew his sword and granted her the mercy of a quick death. The Maker wept for his beloved, cursed Mafarath, cursed mankind for the betrayal, and turned once again from creation, taking only Andraste with him. And Our Lady sits still at his side, where she still urges him to take pity on his children. From the servants of Justinia the Second. One more. The Black City. No traveler to the Fade can fail to spot the Black City. It is one of the few constants of that ever-changing place. No matter where one might be, the city is visible, always far off, for it seems the only rule of geography in the Fade is that all points are equidistant from the Black City. That's interesting. The chant teaches that the Black City was once the seat of the Maker, from whence he ruled the Fade, left empty when men turned away from him. Dreamers do not go there, nor do spirits. Even the most powerful demons seem to avoid the place. It was golden and beautiful once, so the story goes, until a group of powerful magister lords in the Tevinter Imperium devised a means of breaking in. When they did so, their presence defiled the city, turning it black, which was, perhaps, the least of their worries, <laughs> from beyond the veil of spirits and demons by Enchanter Midramel. Ah, Corypheus, why you gotta be such a dick? Now, there wasn't anything in here, right? We read the one that was here. I think we've been through here. I think we're good to go. Okay, so. I'll probably get to those other... Should I just make a codex entry episode for all the ones we just got? Because that was a lot. Or should, <laughs> or should I just... Um, Tack those on to other episodes in, in pieces so it's not so much all at once. Let me know. I know some of you don't even care about the codex entries, but they're really cool to me and I enjoy them a lot. It, it adds a lot more to the universe, knowing the lore, having all that narrative and backstory fleshed out. Okay. I hope each of you have a great rest of your day and I will see you next time.